Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey there, Thunder Buddies and Travelers Down Thunder Road. It's us, Days of Thunder, the WCW Thunder Rewatch Podcast that you didn't ask for, but we did anyway, coming to you as part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network and powered by a large man appears.com. I'm your host, your Chattanooga Choo Choo on Thunder Road, Dave Ryan. And I'm joined as I am every week by my faithful co host, Stagger Lee Malone. Lee, how are you this week? I'm feeling fine, Dave. I'm, I'm in a great mood. Um, I, I, I have one question for you, though. Yeah. What is a Chattanooga choo-choo? I, I believe it's a dance. Is this like the, co- Char- the Charleston? Like, is this their answer to that? Like, I'd be I'd be lying if I said I wasn't currently trying to subtly Google it. Uh, is it old and that's why Larry keeps harping on about it? Uh, why is the Chattanooga choo-choo so famous? Um, this is an actual train. Okay, so it's an actual train. Well, that's what this the choo choo from choo choo dot com slash our story. <laughs> See, we, th- this is why we need to have Sean Cedar on the show. Yeah. Now it definitely is a song as well. Um, so it's a song. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely like an, oh, the movie as well. Uh, a Glenn Miller song. You keep telling me things it's, what it is, Dave, but you, you're not telling me definitively what the Chattanooga truth no, is. No, well, that's because I don't know. <laughs> that's That would be the main reason there. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, mate. you got to give me a... Uh, you got to give me more notice if you actually want answers to this kind of stuff. There's a Choo Choo BBQ in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, do you want to hear about them? I mean, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'm always down for a bit of BBQ. There's, there's some great stuff going on over at the Chattanooga Choo Choo. Uh, it's closed at the moment. It opens 10 a.m. on Wednesday. I'm trying to see if there's any... Uh, what are the reviews like of the, the Choo Choo BBQ? Well, it's got 4.5 stars on Google. Is that out of 5? A pork plate is amazing. Um, the fries are crispy, not mushy. Um, it's a great place to door dash from. Um... They recommend the best seller, which is potatoes with pork. I mean, I'm down for that. <laughs> Just to let you know, though, if you're planning to go there on Tuesday, 12 p.m., is its busiest time. This is fucking scintillating chat to start a podcast, Lee. Thanks for that. Really <laughs> appreciate it. You wouldn't want to start reading the fucking Yelp reviews. Let us know. Well, look, I don't know where to go with that information. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um... Speaking of stuff, uh, that'll be way behind the time by the time this comes out. Um, Coming from a completely uh, different place than you, I saw the Iron Claw this week. You did? This is like the most appropriate venue I have to talk about seeing a a movie. uh, Well, I mean, if you wait a week or two, I will have seen it by the time we're doing the next episode. (laughs) Oh, well, that'll be truly like over a month out of date at that yeah, stage. I know. But go on, go on. Um, give, give us your, well, your brief well, synopsis. I, 
I'll, yeah, I'll just give you your... Well, I, I don't think I need to necessarily recount the plot. Um, so yeah, we, I think a lot of thoughts. people... Yeah, a lot of people who are who are tuned into this will know, and it will be interesting to get your thoughts later on. No. Um, I thought it was brilliant. I, I think it's kind of weird now to have another movie about wrestling that's good. Uh, like, The Wrestler was, was great at the time. Aronofsky's The Wrestler. Um... But movies about wrestling or with wrestlers, as we've learned from our At The Movies series, uh, good ones are few and far between. Um, And this is really, really good. There are obviously, if you're a stickler for history, there are some bits of poetic license and Mm -hmm. uh, some things. It's funny. It's true what a lot of people I read previews of this film from have said where it's like they actually had to reel in what a fucking bummer the Von Erich story is because if they <laughs> like if they did everything exactly like it happened in real life it would be so unrealistically depressing that uh, mainstream audiences would be like there's no way that's true they're, they're laying it on way too thick yeah but like unfortunately it is very much true um, yeah so the, the main stuff they kind of um not gloss over, but compress very much. So they compress Kerry's kind of spiraling towards his death a little bit. Um, I feel like they don't kind of... It all happens in a much more compressed manner um, than actually happened in real life. And then essentially they meld Mike and Chris into one person. Yeah. So it's just Mike in the movie. Chris isn't in it. Um, And, uh, yeah, it's kind of a mishmash of the two of them. Uh, He's there to represent both of them. Um, But it's, yeah, it's just another one of those, like, and it was was funny because I went to see with, I went to see it with my very normie partner who has no real, like, watched wrestling in 2000 up until probably till WrestleMania X7 had no fucking idea who the Von Erics were um, and I very much had to couch her in because like it was I, our friend of the show and former regular OTT attendee Adam was saying the night before he went with his partner and that the entire cinema was sobbing by the end of it oh really <laughs> um, oh, Jesus. yeah and I was just like right so I need to couch this and I just told Emma I was like it's real fucking hardcore what happens to this family like it's not good <laughs> it's fucking not good and it was just funny I tweeted it out but like her main review afterwards she was just like that dad was not nice <laughs> I was like yes Fritz von Erich not not known for being pleasant that's prob- um, probably the nicest uh, the nicest way somebody has ever put it about Fritz von Erich yeah I think uh, your man who plays him whose name I constantly forget uh, but he's a face you would know from loads of things um, Holton Holt, oh, Holt McElhenney. Um, he's really, really good in it. Um, the, maybe the one person whose performance I like wasn't wild about was Lily James as as Pam, Kevin's uh, wife. Okay. Wasn't wasn't mad about her. I thought she was very... Now, obviously, the whole plot is pointed at, like, the Von Erics are the main... The main thing. She's a very ancillary character, but I thought she was very kind of, like... I thought it was a very not performed flat but i thought the character was very flat like existed there to kind of i don't know i don't know there was just something a bit flat when you compare it to like the haunting and deep tragedy of all these brothers and the family um there was just something a little bit kind of mm, like a little step down when it came to how pam was fleshed out well it wasn't like kevin like the main kind of family voice on the movie yeah so it, it's quite possible this is very he, much kevin's he, story he didn't want um his wife being too like central to any particular part yeah. of the story and it is it is very it the whole thing revolves around kevin in a way that like maybe like depending on who you are and what your thoughts on the von Erics at the time were like if you're somebody that doesn't know anything about wrestling you're coming out of this probably thinking that like Kevin should have been the real star of this family. Whereas I think like a lot of people over time, like in terms of raw talents and stuff like that, everybody has kind of like was obviously Kerry. 
Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And to a, they do an interesting thing about like one thing for something that usually when the subject of a biopic has a lot of input on it, you worry about are they going to like like is Kevin going to be okay with stuff that doesn't make him look great, basically. And um, I think they're pretty good at like very accurately portraying like when basically when Fritz decides that like he just doesn't rate Kevin anymore and he thinks you know David's better on the mic so he should push him for David to, to be the, the star guy. of the family yeah. um it does fairly honestly portray how fucking pissed and jealous he is of his brother um and it's funny like I think Jeremy Allen White is great as Kerry like I don't think he has enough to to do in it um, he's missing from like the whole first like maybe 40 minutes of it because it's when he's off like training for the Olympics uh, okay that's when it, it starts then um, so he's off and people are talking about Kerry a lot and then Kerry returns about 40 minutes in and um, I think he's great he has this weird like because I've started watching The Bear as well which Jeremy oh, Allen White is the star of fucking great show and it's so weird watching fucking Carmi be, be <laughs> Kerry at the same time but I think he's great. I think he's the one that has the most like, oh, that's Kerry Von Erich. Do you know what I mean? Like he lo- he looks the most like the the a Von Erich brother of all of them. Um, I I think he's 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 really good. He's he's really good. Um, everybody is 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 really good in terms of performance in this. Um, <laughs> it's a, such a fucking ah oh, it's a classic thing because like maybe there's a while there at the start where you're seeing him just being like a good old southern dad and then like the the fritz of it all like starts creeping into like he drove these kids to this does does it touch on fritz's wrestling career at all there is so it, it opens on like a black and white of him Showing, like, what a vicious, hated heel he was, but then, like, seeing him come outside and he's got, like, I think it's Kevin and Jack Jr. at the time and him just, like, being a dad, but, like, showing how he didn't care about anything as much as he cared about becoming NWA champion. And then, like, fast forward to when he's got the kids and, like, he drives multiple children into the grave because of his obsession with this belt. Uh, because he felt he had personally been slighted about it. Oh, so, but it doesn't that's, that's focus. Such a fucking depressing thought, isn't it? Like, yeah, it doesn't like it doesn't focus on his career that much. Like, okay. cause it's it's mainly the story of the brothers and this kind of domineering father and this kind of like the the mother Dotty being kind of like, um. Not, I wouldn't say detached, but very much like that's the way he does things, kind of like yeah, like she's not kind of contradicting him or cutting across yeah. him, and then especially after like there is an implication that kind of like she was pretty checked out after Jack Junior died, and then when the boys start like when David dies, I think that's like she's just in a downward spiral from then on. Understandably, I think a lot of the guys they cast as. Um, wrestlers from the time uh like so it's very funny seeing ryan nemeth as gino hernandez that's that's very funny to me uh but not in a way that was completely jarring it it did annoy me somewhat that uh the first match you see we ended up i I paid for a cinema ticket to go see chavo guerrero wrestle oh no that's that's the first person who's wrestling against uh what's he actually has this chavo guerrero if only a very Jesse Ventura story way to go about it um, no was he at, you, like resting as his father um, they don't identify him by name I'm assuming that's what it was supposed to be um, I don't I, I mean I can check the IMDB if he's got his character listed because I don't think I, I, mean, I don't think there was a couple of times where Emma was asking me questions about world class and I didn't hear something that was happening uh, on the screen but I don't think who Chavo like I know why he's actually in the movie and that's because he was like the wrestling consultant yeah he oh no he's playing be... the original Sheik what <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah there you go <laughs> uh, and you do get to see um, 
you do get to see like the guy they got to play Harley Race is excellent. He just okay. looks like Harley Race. And I know this because Emma turned to me and she was just like, how did that fat piece of shit become world champion? And I was like, that's the Harley Race vibe. He looks just like an ugly fat dude from a bar, but he beat the tar out of you. Yeah, he's legit um, one of the toughest men in the world, yeah. Yeah, who was it was playing? Um, God, I'm trying to remember who played Brody. Um, fuck. But they they had him like in the in the gear and everything. He wasn't uh, he wasn't uh, like physically in terms of height wise the monster uh, bruiser Brody was, but he looked alright. It wasn't um, the Camarato. No, should have been. But then I, I mean, the one everybody's talked about uh, Flair, is the, yeah. the guy who played Ric Flair is terrible. Like he's not terrible. Like he's doing his best. But it's just one of those, like, you can't get any... Like, Brian Alvarez said it, has been saying it for 20 years on podcasts. It's like, you can't get anyone to play Ric Flair in a film. No. Um, But, like, about half of the current day wrestlers do a better Ric Flair voice impression. Like, this guy wasn't even trying for the voice. Um, Which was, yeah, it was something. But it's a great movie. It's a really... It's a fucking bummer, obviously, if you know anything about the Van Eriks. But it's... Uh, it's great, nonetheless. I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to watching it. Yeah. It was a surreal thing to have people, like, to go to a cinema. It was packed, by the way. Oh, really? Which was weird for my cinema, for any film, let alone an A24 movie about territories wrestling. Um, so that was mental. And then to come out of it and hear people out in the corridors in my local cinema in Ireland talking about the territories... <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had I heard overheard somebody explaining to the people they were with who Bill Mercer was. Oh God! Like it's fucking. It was insane. A- it and was did so Robert surreal. talk to you that last night? Uh, or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a name of their cheek. I mean, listen. I I did see that himself. Has gone to see the movie. So yeah, yeah. Who knows? You know. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, no. Look, look, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, what are we? Are we going to plug the Patreon here? Seeing, uh, see, seeing you as you just the did floor it, is in yours, it, brother, an impromptu uh, at the movies review. Yes, um, we may as well plug plug the Patreon because this week or last week we dropped a new rehash of the champions, rehash ten, um, with a special guest for the first time ever. We had Aaron Quinn on the show. Talking what is one of the worst clashes we've had so far, but an Probably all around the worst, an all around great episode. Um, mm-hmm. so that was last week, and then next week we will have a long awaited TRL as we will be covering Sting's entire AEW run. So we haven't quite decided yet exactly how we're going to go about this, we may select six or seven different matches from the run and look at it that way but we will definitely cover his entire AEW career from start Mm -hmm. right up until Revolution yeah looking forward to it to have that drop right in time for Revolution is is, um, it's weird that we're on top of stuff like this even you having to think about when we dropped that episode because now we're banking episodes of advances. <laughs> so unlike us. Look at us being prepared. Yeah. And then we haven't, I don't think we've announced anything in terms of Patreon for post Stinger show. So we'll save that for, uh, I have on the list here, Days of Thunder 83 in two weeks. Yes. Uh, will be our next free show. So tune in to that in this particular slot. And you'll get your next batch of. Uh, I think we started goodness. saying we're going to announce two months worth of yeah. of programs unless uh, a TRL comes in and changes the arrangement around. Um, so we'll let you guys know um, what you can expect over the next while uh, at a large man appears dot com. All right, should we dive into the observer, buddy? Let's get into the observer before we get into the thunder. Uh, so the first thing I, I read in the Observer this week of relevance to us uh, is of relevance to somebody who comes back as the main character of this episode of um, uh, of Thunder, uh, and that's Scott Norton. Yes. 
Um, so, Dave writes, Just how much damage New Japan did in Tokyo from that disastrous main event on the 828 Jingu Stadium show with Muta versus Nita became evidence this past week when the finals of the annual tag tournament bombed at Budokan Hall. Scott Norton and Keiji Muto won the tournament. So Scott Norton has come back back in having won the New Japan Tag Tournament. Uh, do, do, would you have any sort of a guess as to who they beat in the finals? What's it, Chono and Tenzan? It is Yuji Nagata and Manabu Nakanishi. Oh, okay. Uh, it was uh, what is described by Dave as a mind-boggling finish where uh, Muto made uh, Nakanishi submit, which makes no sense given that he is to challenge Muto for the IWGP title at the Tokyo Dome on 10-11. That's some real fucking Muto brother-brother stuff right there. (laughs) But the big story was the crowd announced publicly as 9,000, but in reality roughly 7,000 or less than half a house. It was the smallest New Japan crowd in Jingu Stadium in at least 20 years. Oof. Not good. Um, and then they were saying part of it can be explained because they were pushing the Tokyo Dome with the long-awaited Hashimoto versus Ogawa in the same market, so people were holding off. Uh, although it's a weak explanation since New Japan has often promoted multiple shows in the Tokyo market at the same time without having trouble filling buildings. New Japan was also without its biggest drawing card down the stretch with Chono suffering a herniated disc in his lower back. But that's not a valid excuse for the show bombing either since Chono has been injured and out of action uh, a great deal over the past year anyway. Uh, so everything is going great in New Japan. One of those things where it's eerily similar to what's going on now. Yeah, Not well, injuries, but just in terms of like, oh, business, bit shaky. They're about to hit the fucking, the new Enochism phase fairly soon. So yeah, yeah, it yeah. only gets worse. Trust me. Yeah, we're all <laughs> 2024, 1999. Everything's about to hit the skids. Um, this is a very famous week in wrestling. Do you know why, Lee? No, tell me. Paced by the biggest opposed quarter hour in history. Um, oh my God. Raw beat Nitro by the biggest head to head margin in history on 927. A 20 minute long segment spoofing a famous television show of the past called This Is Your Life on The Rock drew. Do you remember what the quarter was? Oh, uh, it was insane. It was, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was just. It was an, nuts. an 8.39. Madness. Now the thing, the thing we need to tell you all about the Rock. This is your life segment. It's fucking terrible. Oh, if you ever go back and watch it, it is dog shit. Yeah, uh, this is what. <laughs> this is great. The skit featured actors and actresses brought in as the Rock former home ec teacher, former football coach, and a former high school girlfriend. It certainly wasn't sports, and it would be hard-pressed to call it entertainment, as it came off like one of those Saturday Night Live skits that goes on ever or forever with no punchline, although The Rock did get to lay the verbal smackdown. Actually, the segment with the high school girlfriend where The Rock was getting her back for cutting him off at second base was pretty funny, and Mankind did have some good lines. That's it, like, Dave is really trying there to give them credit. Mm-hmm. WCW, with the beginning of a Perry Saturn versus Conan match in opposition, do, drew a record low 1.58. Jesus Christ. To show it was the Rock segment that was so good and not the Conan versus Saturn match that was so bad, the portion of the Conan versus Saturn match that aired after the Rock segment immediately jumped back to a 2.4 and Raw dropped by pretty much the same amount. Uh, so it was one of the best Raw marks in history overall as well. Um, We've got here, Nitro has adopted some new booking policies, which this show was the first example of. There were primitive, raw-like storylines throughout the show, with Hogan getting attacked twice by Sting, being taken out in an ambulance, and of course showing up at the end of the show to make a big heroic comeback. I don't want to get too much into that uh, for now, but this is basically, note this, not the last time you'll hear it in The Observer. They're throwing the baby out with the batwater and changing the whole booking philosophy. We've so, we've noticed it, Lee, in the last couple mm-hmm. of weeks. There are some changes. Some of them, what we're seeing on Thunder is mostly the positive changes in terms of actual week-to-week booking. Um, but it, it it's clear that they're doing a lot of the car crash headline-grabbing stuff on Nitro at the moment. 
Um, let me just uh, see what we've got next. Ah, yes, something we've been talking about for a couple of weeks that was was coming up in the news. The E Channel did a heavily publicised one hour special called Inside Pro Wrestling, which aired on nine twenty six, which was neither inside nor showed any insight. <laughs> <laughs> the show featured various short features on subjects in pro wrestling, including the war, the Nitro Girls, uh, uh, Ventura. Oh, the same Ventura, California kids doing their backyard wrestling, along with David Fleming, an amateur wrestling reporter who works for Sports Illustrated, heavily ripping pro wrestling, and a few academic types. One a fan, one who wasn't, but both of whom came across as clueless. <laughs> the show was wrapped around the house. Uh, the host, Todd Newton, Training with some of Rick Bassman's students in Southern California, including uh, Nils Allen Stewart, whose main claim to fame is that he played Jesse Ventura in that really bad NBC bio oh, movie. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It all comes which despite, back. It all brings which, us back to that. I know. It all comes full circle. Which, despite Newton's uh, over overplayed pain and taking bombs, actually made uh, doing it seem very easy and something of a joke, although somewhat painful. Um, Stewart was billed as one of the country's top pro wrestling trainers with the claim he's trained five wrestlers in the past year who have signed WWF contracts actually Bassman has been very good at recruiting people both men and women who have the kind of look in particular the physique that WWF is interested in he was the person who first discovered and set up training for both Jim Helwig and Steve Borden and came up with their original power team gimmick and getting the developmental deals, although their deals are more because they have the look and are seen by WWF as raw projects as opposed to actually having world-class training. I kind of want to see that, um, that inside pro wrestling thing. I haven't looked for it, but I'm sure it must be somewhere. I absolutely do not want to see it. <laughs> it would be a different one because another one we always say we're not doing here is wrestling, but another one that everybody always does on a wrestling podcast is the uh, wrestling's greatest secrets reveals. Oh, God. You know, the one with the stunt granny. It's so bad. Which is funny, bad, but it also has been done to death. Yeah. You know? Anyway, there's a huge announcement in the observer this week. Go for it. Remember where you were this week in history. Starting on 10 4. I'll be hosting a two-hour daily pro wrestling call-in show called Wrestling Observer Live on the internet on the new IADA.com sports channel. Oh, wow. It's the start of the IADA era. Yes. The fucking Wild West. (laughs) Do you have any particular favorite IADA memories? Because I got Uh, some. Ah, no. Go on, I'll leave it. Look, like I said before, I'm not a big Dave History guy. Like, I'm only recent to like the observer and okay. alvarez and stuff so you, uh, you, you have my, you have your whole history with them my two favorites are a a teenage david bixon span ringing into eric bischoff to ask him very seriously why uh scott steiner wasn't arrested for assault on nitro for some angle he did and bischoff being like it's fucking fake asshole <laughs> basically uh, or the one about where uh, Jim Cornette was asked, uh, you know, a bunch of people he hates are in a boat. Who would he save? And he says, uh, oh, "I was sinking. You can, you have, you have to save one, and you can only save one. Who would it be?" And he says, "Vince Russo." And Brian Alvarez is a gas, and he goes, "Yes, I'd save Vince Russo because when I drag him back to shore, there's no witnesses left to see what I do to him." <laughs> I'm stunned to learn that uh, David Bixon spam was a cop caller, even as a teenager. Do do you remember when Jim Cornette was like the fun kind of cantankerous? Yeah, <laughs> that we could yeah. all get on board with. So so many good ROH shoot uh, interviews and stuff. And yeah. Then then he just had to go and be full, full corny. Also, as I believe I mentioned on uh, our Clash of the Champions, our rehash of the Champions that just went up went up. Um. Tom Zank was always always a highlight when he was on um when he was on Wrestling Observer Live. His um God, what was it? Was it Bill Barnett was the promoter? Oh, uh What was his fucking name? I can't think of his first name, but it was Barnett anyway. Oh Jim Bar- Jim Barnett. Was Jim, uh, it was Jim Barnett, Jim Barnett, yeah, yeah. He uh he does a great he does a lot of great voices Tom Zank but Bill uh, Jim Barnett is, uh, is particularly good. I I think I was trying to think of Bill Bill Barons that's what I thought you were talking yeah, about yeah that, that's what I'm getting I'm I'm mixing the two of them because he he was involved with TNA and stuff hmm. 
Uh, now I will, as I do uh, every week, I will finish off with the WCW news briefs. WCW had a meeting with Hogan this past week where he was told that they were going to start this week promoting Goldberg as the top star of the company. Anyway, the idea is that all television shows will end with Goldberg. Technically, Nitro's final scene was Sid finding his car smashed up, which is a fucking iconic <laughs> moment in Nitro history. Why me? Never, <laughs> if you've never seen Sid both over and underacting, finding his car in a tiny cube. 22! <laughs> <laughs> Goldberg! Goldberg! We're we're trying to reduce the number of nights of nitros, okay? But don't think I didn't briefly think, should we do one just for this 30 seconds of gold? At the end of the three-hour show. Yeah. But the show uh, appeared to be completely built around Hogan anyway. A lot of people continue to question the booking where all the faces get laid out for Hogan to make the save. When it would be better to create a younger star by having Hogan and Flair laid out for the new star to save them, whether it be Goldberg or even taking someone else to elevate. Uh, line up for Halloween Havoc uh, in Las Vegas on 10:24 appears to be Sting versus Hogan, Vicious versus Goldberg, uh, Hart versus Luger, Flair versus Page, Benoit versus Steiner, uh, Saturn versus uh, Saturn versus Eddie Guerrero. Douglas and Malenko sorry it's already Eric Guerrero Douglas and Malenko versus Mysterio and Kidman um, so I think maybe I think Dave wrote this like after Nitro okay um, but before the next Thunder so we know from a segment we talk about that there there's they have been teasing dissension amongst the members of the um, the revolution, revolution for a bit now mm-hmm um, so them being split off into different matches, Saturn versus Guerrero, Douglas and Malenko versus Mysterio and Kidman. Uh, there are also, oh, there are also reports this will be combined into a six man and Brad Armstrong versus Berlin. Uh, look at that lineup and find where anyone is being groomed by an older wrestler for future stardom. That's fairly, that's fairly accurate. They need to realize that the ratings and house show decline is not, is going Uh, is not going to stay stagnant if things don't change. It's only going to continue to get worse. Um, There are stories going around the internet about people being fired. At time of press, the only people we could confirm uh, are that some power plant developmental deals were dropped, although we don't know the names. That Scott Vick, aka Sick Boy, who WWF is interested in and showed potential. James Vandenberg... (laughs) <laughs> and they were like, when was the last time that guy was around? And Public Enemy, they've all been dropped. And at Nitro... They, they all show up in ECW at some point. At Nitro, wrestlers who had read their own name on the internet were asking around if they had a job and no one seemed to know for sure. Oh my but God. Eric Watts is still with the company and Silver King was just given a chance to be in his first angle. So that seems to indicate they aren't losing their jobs right now. Uh, there will probably be more cuts to come. As far as Savage goes... There are no plans to use him except for personal experience or personal appearances. And considering his contract, which expires in a few months, it will be logical to think there's a strong chance he won't be renewed. But stranger uh, things have happened. WWE officials have strongly hinted Jim Ross and outright said Vince Russo that they aren't interested in him. <laughs> uh, sorry, just skipping past the house show results. Uh, WCW prelim wrestler Dave Burkhead wrestles on indies now under the name Knuckles Sandwich, which we talked about before on the show as one of his famous aliases. Uh, With all the injuries that stemmed from that battle royal over and other hardcore matches, the concept for the most part was dropped by Bischoff before he lost power. Um, Flair's 26-year-old daughter Megan was married on 925 in Minneapolis. Gene Okerlund's daughter was married in Minneapolis the same night. The only wrestling person at the Flair wedding was Mark Madden. Oh, Jesus Christ. Ultimo Dragon was at Nitro and was scheduled to meet with WCW the next day. His recovery is not looking good uh, and he was not optimistic about his chances of returning to the ring. Uh, Interestingly enough, because he just passed away, Ice Train was backstage at Nitro looking for work, having dropped 60 pounds and there is interest in signing him. He does come back, yeah. Yes. Uh, this is uh, it's so funny. ICP is now out this week. 
<laughs> Sometimes I think this is every week to just to keep themselves in the news, except uh, there is always backup to the story. Anyway, even though they claimed last week they had signed a new deal with WCW, they hadn't. WCW changed the contract from 75 dates max per year to 150 dates max per year. Why would you need and 150 their... dates on the ICP? Why would you need 75, Lee? Yeah, that's true. Uh, with their touring schedule, they couldn't make that kind of commitment. Some are saying WCW gave them the contract on purpose as a way to get rid of them after the attempted jump to ECW. There may also be another factor. As part of their new deal, they were going to be allowed to promote their music. An ICP music video aired on the 920 Nitro and also pass out sample CDs at the house shows. However, before this was agreed to, they went to a house show in Michigan to pass out sample CDs and the WCW office got numerous complaints from parents when the kids got home and played the thing. It was all the IC to ICP swearing rap. It really shocked me that WCW would allow them to promote their music as part of the deal in the first place since the Turner organization is so squeamish about things like that. The list of wrestlers scheduled to appear in the WCW movie, which will ha- uh, have wrestling sequences filmed all day at uh, the 1016 and 1030 TV tapings in Grand Olympic uh, Auditorium in LA, are Goldberg, Savage, Gorgeous George, Sting, Disco, Page, Kimberly, Mysterio Jr., Saturn, Kidman, Scott Steiner... Sid, uh, Conan, Juventud Guerrero, Bigelow, Booker T, Canyon, Chris Hennig, and other Nitro girls. Most, if not all of them, are in the final Mm -hmm. cut of the film. It's funny that even though Savage is on the out and they're looking to get rid of him, he's still booked to be in the movie. Um, Over the past few weeks, merchandise has been averaging at only $5.46 per head. Uh, Medusa returned... Uh, doing an interview segment on Saturday night. Uh, Saturday uh, and night? Nitro, Jesus. Yeah. And Nitro is still the number one uh, Monday night show in the UK. Okay. Uh, averaging 240,000 viewers to Raw's 210,000. That would have been because Nitro was still on a free-to-air channel. Mm-hmm. Whereas Raw was behind a paywall on Sky Sports. And it was still close. Um, the only WWF bit of news I want to get into. So uh, WWF won the lawsuit with Playboy. So Playboy now have to stop printing references to Raw and Sable on the cover of her issue. Um, there's further arguments in court about whether they should be given the money that Playboy have made off it so far. Um, and then the only other note is that um, sadly it looks like you know, and we know what eventually does happen, but they're saying Gorilla Monsoon's condition has worsened, um, and he has he has liver and kidney problems. He suffered a mild heart attack, and he's been in hospital for the last month. Rough. Yeah, yeah, poor guy. Right, shall we move over to Thunder? Let's get into the Thunder. So this is Thunder episode 82 from Chattanooga, Tennessee, doing the Chattanooga Choo Choo, 30th of September, 1999, getting a 2.1 rating, uh, which was down by 0.1. They seem to be circling around this 2.2, 2.1 rating a lot now. Uh, I think we'll be settled in here until old Vinnie Roo gets on board. Um, what I want to say before we start, Lee, it's pretty fucking good Thunder. I, I really enjoyed this Thunder. Um. Yeah, it, it's like I think the crowd help a bunch. I think that the the crowd in Chattanooga are great. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I I, I think this like you, we were kind of texting back and forth as we were both watching it, and like you you said it great. Like the the first forty minutes, well, not you know necessarily all time great or anything, but such just such a breeze to watch. Like it wasn't yeah. heavy. There wasn't. Like, a load of fucking shit that we normally have to put up with on the show. Mm. It was, yeah, it was just, it flowed well. It mostly made sense. Everything, like, everything was paced right in terms of nothing outstayed. It's welcome. I was enjoying it. It does, as we will get to, fall off a fucking cliff for a couple of matches. Mm Mm-hmm. But it finishes strong. I think overall, like this is probably the best thunder in months, in months, yeah. months. Yeah, and high probably of the eighty-two we've done, it's definitely on the higher end. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
Right, let's start us off. Tanae invites us to look ahead to Halloween Havoc, as WCW are in the spotlight here in the home of the Chattanooga Choo Choo, as he says. Uh, another uh, mixed Larry reaction, as you were saying to me in the, the old DMs, Lee, he's getting the Cody reactions. Yeah, Larry got the, the Cody pop, and uh, that gave me hope that this crowd actually are engaged with what's going on, so... Um, yeah. A li- little bit of boon and a lot of kind of Larry Larry, so, you know... Yeah, that when when Larry is standing up to like four people applauding, you know what kind of show you're in for. But th- this was a good lot of the crowd were were looking for Larry here. Hundred uh, percent. Apparently, and this probably speaks to how poor this rating ended up being. Um, today says that they had the lead in uh, for the second time running from an Atlanta Braves game, so they've got a lead in from live sports and they're still at a 2.1 yeah well, that's I mean, not great for I mean, me look pe- people turn off their fucking game and just go straight to sports center or whatever mm-hmm. um i know that they're doing again when wcw are on it they are really good at repetitively drilling into you what the big two matches on a pay-per-view are mm-hmm. and this whole segment is about them going sting versus hogan sid versus goldberg and talking about why each match is fucking massive yeah. and that is what you want. And, like, look, we'll give them credit. They literally booked both those matches, like, within a week of the, the last pay-per-view. And they were like, look, mm-hmm. these matches are happening. I have a... And like you said, they've just fucking beat you, over, oh, excuse me, beat you over the head with it. Um, mm. And, yeah, uh, like, they announced two more matches on this show. And today, like, makes a big deal of it. He's like, oh, we're going to have another couple of matches announced on this show, so stay tuned. Yeah, and as you said, like from listening to the Observer, they're doing a bit more of the kind of internalized stories on each show. Like obviously Hogan being the focus of Nitro isn't great, but Mm. like on this show, there's like a running storyline of Goldberg's gonna be on in action. Then we have Goldberg's opponent show up, and then we have a Goldberg main event, and like it's just simple ABC booking. Yeah, like and it's like it. I was just gonna say last like last week it was Van Hammer. Now obviously we don't we don't hear how Van Hammer got on on <laughs> on Nitro, but that that's okay. I've got a, I've got a little bit on that, but um, yeah. like that's just that kind of simplistic making even the most basic of things like a Van Hammer match feel important. Mm. Yeah, for sure, and it shouldn't be so exceptional that we have to point it out. No. Um. But unfortunately, it is, you know, um, we've gone from literally last month where it was two weeks or th- between two and three weeks out from a pay-per-view and newspapers and media were complaining that they, they genuinely didn't know what the card was. Mm-hmm. Um, we open with a six man tag match. We kind of alluded to it there during the Observer segment that Silver King is back in town uh, along with Viano 5 and the returning Viano 4. Uh, to take on Juventud Guerrera, La Parca, and a an unmasked Psychosis. Um, he's out under the the big the, the gigantic towel covering his head mm-hmm. uh, because he's embarrassed. This is Viano's first match, Viano Four's first match in eleven months. Um, he had uh, broken his back, I believe, is what they said. So in, in his time away, Dave, have you learned the difference between Viano 4 and Viano I knew, 5? I knew this was going to be the first thing. Do you know what? Larry couldn't tell. It was, oh, was yeah. No, so so you're, comparing, you're saying that because Larry didn't know it's okay. I'm comparing myself to Larry in as much as I, too, am a living legend. <laughs> Who would much? Who in this moment would much rather be on the golf course than dealing with my broadcast partner talking shit? Listen, um, just because I don't think all Vianos are the same like you do. There was an incredibly condescending moment where um, he had to teach Larry Roman what numerals. Roman numerals yeah, are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I all I could think about was like Viano three plus Viano four is Viano seven. Adrian's <laughs> revenge. <laughs> Um, um, but let, let, let's talk I about even this. wrote right lately I, could, I knew you were going to do this so much that my first note oh sorry my second note my, my first note uh, on this match was Larry is stunned by how sexy psychosis is <laughs> look very true handsome young man but I wrote <laughs> Larry has taken the gimmick Lee tries to put on me of not knowing which Viano is which I mean you don't you you, you 
You think uh, all the are the you same? In, you thus infer that you know. I do know. I can yeah. I can tell the difference between the Vianos. Can you? Yes. Is it because one has a four and one has a five? Uh, all that matters is I know the difference. <laughs> Whereas you like to point Piece out you shit. don't. Can we talk about Parker's entrance gear? We can. It's fucking sick. It's incredible, man. isn't it? <laughs> um, so, Leparka, Psychosis, and Hoovy. Awesome trio. But, yeah, yeah no, Le- Leparka's, like, his, like, military-style jacket with the, the skull. Like, I know his face is always a skull, but, like, he has that yeah. kind of, like, death skull kind of mask. It's it's great. It's, like, he dresses as a skeleton all the time, and his lush entrance gear is just a slightly more elaborate skeleton. Yes. So it's good. It's a great bit. Um, but apparently Silver King was part of... The Hoovy, Psychosis, Leparka, and Chavo group on Monday. Mm-hmm. And now he's wrestling against them with no explanation. Is this what we're... That obviously by this Nitro that Dave is talking about, that they put some explanation on that? Or they start pushing him in the direction of like actually having an angle? Like, I'm psyched. You Like, we are oh. long since on record about how much we love Silver King. Yeah, we've, we've always talked about Like, we love getting any kind of matches of Silver King, so... If he's going to be featured a little bit more, absolutely behind it, whether it's with this kind of luchador group or opposing them, it's fine by me. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, ma- maskless, maskless psychosis is, uh, it's quite the, like, it's like, you know, it's coming, but it's kind of odd to now see him on WCW without the mask. Yeah. I also think about like, what six years later when the mexicals come into wwe and i'm just like jesus fucking six years he aged about 20 oh he had a hard fucking couple of years between runs the fucking road alone you mate Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's it's yeah so this match this match was just good like this was just good tv wrestling like if you have access to like top range luchadors like WCW has like AEW has mm. now hell yeah you just put them on TV and let them go out there and have a match yeah so Hoovy goes through the paces with both Vianos before we switch to the superior combo of Psychosis and Silver King which I was fucking loving mm-hmm. uh, King hams up the heat as Tanae has to explain that sometimes people have nicknames to Larry <laughs> because he doesn't get that uh, Silver King is Silver King but he's also referred to as El Rey Loco, the Mad King. He can't get his head around this. Keeps calling him Silver Loco. And he's just like, he changed his name. And today he's like, no, no, Larry, he didn't. People just also call him this. Mexican people are allowed, are allowed to have nicknames as well. Living legend. Yeah. Uh, all Larry could uh, repost to that is like, well, he's got these really large eyeballs today. <laughs> Um, uh, Larry then immediately completely fucks it calls him Silver Loco again just when he thought he he had understood it uh, King attempts to pin Psychosis Hoovy breaks up with a, spring, a springboard leg drop that also somehow lands on Psychosis' face uh, Hoovy attempts a plancha Vi- the Vianos catch him and then Parker does a corkscrew plancha and takes all three men out people are super behind Psychosis as he does his big comeback uh, King knocks him off the top rope Vianos accidentally take out King Parker with a suicide dive Onto one of the Vianos uh, Psychosis hits a guillotine leg drop for the win But Hoovy had the leg This is what I thought was just like Could you not have just let him Psychosis get the clean pin But Hoovy has to come in and hold on to a leg To be like yeah I helped <laughs> yeah, I mean it's Hoovy Hoovy does stuff like that um, One thing you missed out on Is early in the match When, when La Parker tags in and I think he's in there with, I think it's Silver King and the Vianos kind of come in. They have a, like a little bit of miscommunication with Silver King, and Silver King gets knocked to the outside, and Leparka kind of chases down the Vianos into the corner, and then just does a little mm-hmm. dance, yeah, and then just does his little str- his little strut away out of the corner. <laughs> I love Tremendous I man. love Leparka so much. He's great. He's great. There's this bit like at the very yeah at the very start where like. Uh, Silver King kind of like respectfully lets him boogie for a second and he's like nah fuck you <laughs> attacks him <laughs> you've danced too long sir uh, but Leparka known he wasn't the star of this match decides to just bust out like two or three suicide dives because he can uh, yeah Um. next match we have Norman Smiley versus Adrian Bird Lee 
Color me crazy. I fucking love this match. This is a this is a, a, gr- a lovely little match. This is a lovely little TV match. This is like Adrian Bird is such a solid little TV wrestler. Like he's been on the show yeah. a couple of times now. Um, he his comes, job is to come out and eat shit. Like he, he he comes out and he comes out to Vampiro's music, or as I know it as yeah. Vampiro's music. Um, and yeah, he's just like he's like Jonathan Gresham, but like four inches taller. And less technical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he's built like he's just he's so wide for such a small guy. Um, yeah. Like I think I think they really could have done something with this guy. Yeah. I meant I meant to look up his cage match. I'm actually going to look it up now to see. He's got a surprisingly low cage match rating, so I'm wondering is it that like Norman Smiley is so good? Um. But yeah, like Norman being back is great. Like I don't think Norman was gone away anywhere. I think it's just no. the fact that he hasn't been on Thunder. Yeah. And he's going to be a guy who, like, the more Thunder goes on, he is, like, when he gets to the scream in Norman Smiley, he is, like, a regular Thunder wrestler. Um, Adrian Bird is only five foot three. Yeah. Train- so your Gresham comparison was not far off. Tra- trained by uh, Johnny Rods, who also notoriously yeah. fa- trained other short man, Taz. Hmm. Um, so obviously there was a height restriction in that training school but the door was low yeah unfortunately Adrian Bird is done by 2000 yeah Uh, only 32 career matches on on cage match Mm -hmm. so I wonder I wonder did he have like an injury or something but um, I'm just gonna say that's not the that's not the most interesting dive into cage match we're gonna have on this show oh can't we (laughs) <laughs> if I remembered to copy and paste what I intended to. Um, but Norm, can, during this match... I was just going to say, can we, can we talk about Norman's gear? Go for it. I mean, silver or off-white, whatever it is, it, it's not a great look for uh, L. Norman here. No. Very kind no. of kind of washed out looking. I, I, I'm yeah. living for the era of Norman coming out in the local sports team jersey. Yeah. The cheap cheap pops oh, yeah. and Norman's smiling. Absolutely, can't wait for it. 100%. Um, during this match, Tanae lets us know that there has been a rebrand. We must now no longer call Lex Luger Lex Luger. He now is simply referred to as the total package. I had a thought. So that's the era we're in now. I had a thought about this. Yeah. Oh, and Elizabeth's back as well. Yes, Miss, Miss Elizabeth is back with, with uh, Flexi Lexi. So, like, when we started this podcast, we very famously talked about the biggest Lex Luger fan in all of Europe. Mm-hmm. So do, do you think... And I, one of potentially Europe's most prolific serial killers. <laughs> well, I mean, look, we can't prove anything. We weren't killed, but it doesn't mean he didn't want us. <laughs> um, that's a, that's an, that's literally a Days of Thunder episode one story. Lore. That, that's lore for yeah. you. Um, so I was thinking, like, was this moment the moment his killing spree began? <laughs> when Lex Luger was like no he more. Couldn't handle the rebrand. Yeah. Quite possible. Quite possible. I mean, that would send me over the edge if I was addicted to one Lex Luger. Um, what have we got here? Uh, oh, I meant to say that uh, Norman Smiley is delighted with life when he came out and he said down the camera. He knows everyone's here to see the wiggle. And you know what? He's not lying, Lee. He's oh, not the, lying. the wiggle gets such a pop. Uh, Adrian Bird gets a lot of this match. Mm-hmm. Like, when these two came out, I thought, right, this is as close to, uh, like, a Norman Smiley squash as you're going to get. Uh, but he, he gave him an awful lot. Um, again, I wonder why, for a man that has been down in Florida teaching trainee wrestlers for so many years... How has no one stolen the wind-up scoop slam? Well, we know one person stolen it. Oh, who is it again? That fucking charlatan that, that wrestles in TNA right now. The, the fucking the Genetti of the, ma- oh, the Major Brothers. Yes, the Prince of Queens yeah, himself, yeah. your favourite wrestler. Yes. Um, Bird takes him down with an uppercut and hits... Uh, oh, yeah. He does one uppercut. Norman Smiley takes a flat back and then he immediately 
Adrian Burke goes down to one knee and pops the double bicep. <laughs> Lost it for that. That was great. I've done one move, one strike, and I shall showboat. Uh, Larry puts over the well-rounded wrestling education of Norman. He talks about what is a lost art nowadays of wrestlers who literally tour different countries, different territories to round out their education and add different strings to the bow. That generation does not exist anymore. Excuse me, sir. Lexus King has gone all around the world. (laughs) Good Lord. Um... Back and forth, pinning combinations. They do the double whiffed drop kick spot. Uh, Norman recovers the quicker of the two. Uh, there's a long chin lock spot. Uh, Norman hits a great spinning, uh, a spin out butterfly suplex. It's really nice, yeah. Look class. Uh, wins with the Norman conquest, and that was a very fun little match. Yeah, it was. It was a nice little little kind of uh, undercard match. I, I'd gladly mm-hmm. accept one of those every week. Then we have what might be one of my favorite bleed-in segments we've ever done. Uh, I am just, like, shocked about how, for a company that essentially doesn't have a women's division, for multiple weeks now, the women's segment with actual wrestling is, one, maybe the best wrestling, and two, gets the crowds going more than almost anybody on the show. So we start out with Mona on the ramp with Mean Jean. She's the one thing about her we'll say, because you know, she is very early on in her career, is she is whispering into that fucking microphone. And it is hard to hear what she's saying. She puts over the laundry list of wrestlers she's wrestled so far on WCW. Uh Jean asks for her thought on the uh the shady finish from uh Brandy Alexander the previous week. Says that doesn't matter, she always gives a hundred percent. Brandy runs out and absolutely fucking decks her bulldozes <laughs> true her yeah it's great. takes her high heel and starts battering her face with the heel and we've got a match lee i love it yeah so good um yeah like th- this feud has been great i like it it's it's barely a feud because wcw like up until this point hadn't really acknowledged it at all yeah but these two women are just talk about maximizing your minutes the one criticism I would have of this match is that they shouldn't have gone to the ring. Once they start having to wrestle, the heat goes down a couple of gears until the finish. Would, would, would you have just done like a, a beatdown segment? Because they could... Well, no. I would have just had this wild brawl that went on for as long. Oh, right. Because a lot of the spots that they do in the match, they could have done in an outside-the-ring brawl. Um... But it was when they got in and started, like, doing actual razzling Mm. at the end that, like, I was still enjoying it. But you could tell the crowd wanted a fight this night. Um, So there's great stuff. Like, when they they, they do some chain wrestling, Mona is uh, really quick in the ring. Mm -hmm. Like, she doesn't know exactly where she's supposed to be all the time yet. But, like, she is very fast. Uh, Crossbody for two hits a snap where Brandy hits a jawbreaker for heat. Brandy does this bit where she takes off the the long glove that Mona has on and chokes her with it. But then when the ref comes around, tries to hide it in the crook of her arm that she's being choked. That's good old school heel shit. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a bit of an awkward backslide attempt where I think someone's balance was a bit off and it just looked... mm. Uh, The story of the match is that Brandy is like vicious and hitting Mona with absolutely everything and can't get anything close to a three count fairly and the only time she's getting near falls is when she's trying to like leverage a pin or she's trying to choke her or she can't do it fairly mona attempts to fire back gets poked in the eye mona attempts her bridging indian death lock but brandy gets the rope uh, tez press and then chops for mona sidewalk slam for two northern lights for two stomps in the corner yanks brandy out top rope frankensteiner for the win yeah, the, the, I thought that was a cool little finish. Like, the, the handspring back elbow straight into the, the top rope Rana. Like, that was yeah. pretty fucking... pretty. Like, it was a clean finish, but, like, it was a pretty smooth finish as well for, mm-hmm. like, Mona not having the most experience in the world at this point. This was the hoot of the night. Absolutely. Um, speaking of hoot, I hooted at the start of this match. This next match, Dean Roll versus Frankie Lancaster. Lee! Do you know who these two men are? Well, one is Dean Roll. I know that. You know who Dean Roll is? No, go on. Who is it? Okay. So, 
I'll give you Frankie Lancaster first. You might know Frankie Lancaster. Yeah, he's a, he's a jo- long time jobber for for years and years. I think he is better known to some older wrestling fans as Heartbreaker Adonis. Okay. Uh, you remember the Heartbreakers, Apollo and Adonis? Bre- uh, well, briefly. Dean Roll would go on to quite a bit of fame under a norm- under a, a completely different gimmick. What if I were to ask you, Lee, to give me I, a I, show? I, I, yeah. Just as you said, another gimmick, I, it came to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's of course, Shark, Shark Boy. Yes. It's Shark Boy. The man who is living off the money he got from Robert Rodriguez. <laughs> um, yeah, so so this was odd to see these two come out and have a, a competitive match. It was very strange, wasn't it? Because usually you get the new guy against an established guy, or you get one or the other being fed to a monster. But this was just two guys that aren't on TV wrestling each other on TV. This felt like they accidentally aired a dark match. Um, am I out to lunch to say that Frankie Lancaster should have been the WCW version of Hardcore Holly? Okay. Am I the only Explain one? Explain you're working. No, just they, they look really similar. Uh, yeah. Lan- Lancaster gives off that kind of pissed off veteran vibe. Yeah, I think he could have carried it. Do you remember how I said um, usually it's one or the other man getting fed to a monster? They both get fed to um, a monster. Because this is it. We were sitting there and we're just like watching this just match for a while. I was like, something's off about this. <laughs> and then, Lee, I think this is the moment where you came out of your chair. The, it's like the, the, the Rick Steiner that we actually want rather than yes. actual Rick Steiner. Big fucking Scott Norton comes back and fucking pulverizes these men flash norton is just an unadulterated one of my faves just seeing him get in the ring and pummel people is fucking great um the power bomb he gives to the enroll where he like you know when some, you're giving somebody a power bomb like they're dropping your shoulders but that where they they place them on one shoulder over one shoulder oh yeah. it's so fucking good uh and like frankie lancaster's a big boy and he got him up as well mm-hmm. for the over the shoulder power bomb um, two things I gotta say before we, we move on I wanna talk about the promo in a sec but the, the first thing before the promo is uh, I think my favourite line of the night from Larry on commentary is Frankie Lancaster is greased up and ready to go and then later on because he's just like I, I think we were all in awe of how much baby oil was on Frank mm-hmm. Lan- Frankie Lancaster he goes <laughs> Dean rolls in there with a veteran more oiled up than my viper <laughs> I wrote down this Scott Norton promo because it fucking rocked. Go for it. Firstly, you want to know how little of a fuck Scott Norton gives, Lee? I, I do. He's still in his NWO gear. Yeah, I, I did note that for later on, yes. Okay, so he goes, see, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And to get the attention of a certain man, um, this is what you got to do. I ain't starting at the bottom I'm going all the way to the top, and I ain't waiting very long. Goldberg, I'm next. Fuck, that's a great promo. It really is. Like it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> now, I will say, in his defence, Scott was still in the NWO Japan. Yeah. Hence why him and Muto won the tag league. True. True. Um, this is a fabulous promo. And then we get immediate follow-up after the break. Tanae's in the ring, introducing the hottest superstar in wrestling today, Goldberg. Oh, fucking he what, asked for, what, what a pop. What a pop. He asks for a response to Scott Norton. He says, week after week, he steps in the ring and meets challenges head, not, head on. He respects Norton's dominance in Japan, but we know each other, and I know what I'm going to get, and you know what you're going to get. So tonight, I'll grant your wish. If it means dropping you and putting you amongst the loneliest people I've ever demolished, so be it. And then as if that wasn't badass enough, he goes, Hey, Sid, clock is ticking. He says, I want you to watch closely to what I do to Scott tonight because the same fate awaits you at Halloween Havoc. God, Fuck it, just simple pro wrestling, man. Goldberg was fucking brilliant there. And I don't know if you, you yeah. clocked it, there's literally a, a, a camera angle for a brief, brief second where Gene is just in the background and Goldberg kind of looks at him and Gene just looks at him yeah. with like a proud dad look going yeah you're doing great <laughs> yeah 
Um, no, that definitely be the best Goldberg promo we've we've seen so far. Mm-hmm. Our next match. Sadly, things can't necessarily con- uh, continue. Um, now, I think there are things to enjoy about this match, but we'll talk about it. It's the first families, Brian Nobbs and Hugh Morris with Jimmy Hart versus the Brits, Dave Taylor and Stephen Regal with the returning Fit Finley in his sparkly shirt. <laughs> Fit Finley's going out to a disco tonight. Leather pants, sparkly black shirt. Uh, that would, you see the nips through that. That, would, that was his uh, Blackpool you know, outfit. That's for when they were out on, out on yeah. the town with the boys. That's, that's the real back Blackpool combat club, isn't it? <laughs> um... Tanae points out, right, as this is a good bit of actual booking here. Tanae points out that Hugh Morris was involved in the famous junkyard match, and Jimmy Hart, you remember, organized it, where uh, Fit Finley legit nearly lost his leg afterwards. Um, so when the Brits get down to the ring, Fit Finley is up in the faces of the first family, I, pointing at them and threatening is like I'm coming for you you fuck. I believe it was Nobs that put him through the table that severed the fucking arteries in his leg or whatever it was yeah the, the nerves or almost severed the nerves in his legs like that that's the thing like we shit on Finley's wrestling deservedly because it was shit but you gotta give the man credit like he did like almost lose his leg um it was very much touch and go, and the fact that he did come back is kind of something to to behold. For sure. Um, I think a lot of this match is the Brit dads trying to get anything workable out of these sacks of shit. And uh, look, one thing I will always enjoy, no matter how many times they do it, is Dave Taylor stiffing people. <laughs> That's very enjoyable to me. <laughs> For me, this match felt like, yeah, we're going to put the, Brit- the Brits in there with knobs so uh, so Finley can see them beat the fuck out of them. Because yeah. that's what it felt like. It felt like when, when Morris was in there, they were working with knobs. They got their hands on knobs. They were trying to hurt the fucker. Nobs goes outside, and as soon as he becomes exposed on the outside, Finley runs up on him and tries to kill him with a chair. <laughs> Security has to basically tackle Finley out of the way. Uh, and get rid of him as uh, uh, as Dave Taylor yeets knobs out of the ring again and then fucking stiffs this cunt in the face with a flagpole. I was just going to say that. I thought you were going to skip over it. Yeah, he gets the flagpole, he beats him on the back with it a bit, and then he just hits him in the fucking face. <laughs> and then hoofs him into the steps as well. Uh, uh, they, Taylor, I, I don't know if you know this, Dave, but Brian Nobbs isn't the most popular man in the locker room. No, no, this is shocking to me. Yeah. Um, but he's still got brother, brother, brother. Look it out for him. Um, Taylor does a unique bit of offense that none of the crowd got what they were doing because he head scissors Regal into doing a, a, a senton, senton mm-hmm. onto Nobbs. Uh, the crowd completely sit on their hands for that spot. Uh, Nobbs goes for a hot tag, but Dave does as dramatic a leap as a man who looks about 55 years old already in 1999 can do uh, to block it off. Um, he shoves knobs into the ropes face first uh, some scrapping in the corner go on I was here. just going to say I think Dave Taylor was trying to go coast to coast yeah he did not get there he landed somewhere in the midwest um, scrapping in the corner knobs gets cut off again Regal accidentally knocks out Taylor we get a lukewarm tag to Hugh Morris he does the 10 punch which gets people on the side because this is the other thing you pointed out as well Lee is like no wonder the crowd was a little muted for this because we went from really good logical pro wrestling to heel team versus heel team fucking heel team 6 here yeah it's not great uh, whips the Brits into each other Nobbs does a fucking jogging corner splash because god forbid he actually moves around uh, pump handle uh, Nobbs and Regal take each other out of the ring Morris completely overshoots oh, his moonsault for the fucking win fucking misses so badly and they re- yeah. and they, they show it on a replay yeah uh, but you know deserved if you're going to be that shit and use a move you can't hit as your finisher then you deserve to be now I will say the crowd seem to be into Morris more than they are anybody mm-hmm. else in the Force family and look he would get I will say this he was never a main eventer but he does get inexplicably over for how shit he is mm-hmm. uh, for the rest of the run of this company. Uh, we are still mercifully months away from huge erection, but that will become a prominent part of the mid card on TV for a you while. You mean a huge erection will become a prominent part of the show? And I don't just mean the wall, brother. 
Um, Gene introduces the revolution. The whole gang is here. Uh, they do the thing where Shane comes out a few paces ahead of the rest of them, and the commentary tees the recent dissension. Saturn says, uh, Shane, we agreed to get by on athletic ability. The crap you pulled in Cincy won't cut it. So they talk about how he had cheated to win a match. Um, he says, you either ha- you stick to the ethics or you're out. I love Perry Saturn oh. trying to talk about ethics in professional wrestling. No, no, no. Perry Saturn in his, what I can only call yeah. his artist attire. Because he has his yeah. little, little spectacles and his backward hat. Is a- There's no, there, do you know what? There's very few things I think are funnier than wrestlers with big fat heads and tiny glasses. <laughs> that that should be a, an art show. You ever seen Dave Batista is in multiple movies in tiny sunglasses and it's always funny. Um, I think the most, the best part of this promo or of this segment mm-hmm. is the most important part is that Shane Douglas I can report, is back in the arm race, Dave. Yeah. He's only wrestled like six matches, but he's back in the arm race. Yeah. He's sore. <laughs> <laughs> that That's going to be a running bit on this show. Like, I'm going to report on how yeah. often Shane Douglas's arm is back in a cast brace. Yeah. Fucking... He's a one-man continuity disaster. Oh, uh, he's fucking so bad. But uh, his, apolo- his and- apology may be worse. Yeah. Uh, he says you guys know me I get carried away because I want to succeed I am sincerely sorry and I will stick to our code of ethics side by side no one can stop the revolution if they're willing to let bygones be bygones let's raise the fist and they will go on so they fist each other and the crowd pops for it do do, Um, do you want to rephrase that one I don't Um, (laughs) I said what I said (laughs) I'm just fucking stunned that just like that they're blown off this revolution story. Thing is, Lee, they're not. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, they're not. <laughs> well, here's a here's a story that they do blow off. So, so then we get Bobby Eaton versus Luther Biggs with Buzz Stern, and I wrote, "Oh boy, here's the combo breaker for good <laughs> matches on the show." Mm-hmm. Because even that tag match that we just had had the Brits stiffing pieces of shit. That was fun. I wrote, poor Bobby. People are really happy to see him. You know, not in a huge pop, your Goldberg sort of way, but like, ah, look. Look at him earning a living. That's great. Um, Luther is terrible. And Luther is abundantly clear as being terrible when he's just feeding Bobby Eaton. Like, Bobby Eaton is just standing, and all he has to do is run the ropes and hit bo- and take a bump. And he's awful at mm-hmm. it. He is so bad, Lee. Like, he, well, genuinely, firstly, he's one of the worst professional wrestlers I've ever seen. Number two, he is so bad that in his first match, the commentary are burying how bad he is. Yeah, I, 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 I sent it to you. Like, I cannot understand how this made TV. Like if you if you want to put this on Saturday night as a little ha 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 segment, that's fine. But putting this on one of your fucking two big shows is just I don't get it. it it's awful. Like they could have taken anyone out of the the power plant, power plant. to do this kind of do do for gimmick. Because look Eugene, which is only a couple of years away. Like the whole the, who is who is also floating around WCW at the time, so he could have caught this game. That's true. Um, like his whole thing was he's actually a great wrestler, and they do the the horrible gimmick around it. Mm-hmm. Like, why didn't they just take a competent wrestler to do this this bit? I wonder was part of the idea is like he needs to look like a trainee, and they overthought themselves about it, and they're like, well, what if we get an, an actual, actual trainee wrestler? A tr- but yeah, they were like, an actual good wrestler would be too good to fake being bad. So we need someone who's actually bad or green. Oh, it's just so fucking I wouldn't dumb. be surprised. That feels like a WCW thing to think. Would you like, because we're not going to talk about this match, would you like some uh, stats from the uh, the Luther Biggs cage match page? No. Well, you're getting yeah. them. Uh, Luther Biggs retired in 2003. He made it that far. But then had... But then had one match in 2019. 
it has to have been like a fucking GCW battle royal or something. It was an eight man tag. I believe it was a promotion I never heard of because usually if it's a promotion I know of, I write them down and I didn't. Uh, you will have heard of members of one team. Let me give you the other team first. So the losing team in this effort were Ali Muhammad, Chris Ramirez, Cisco Susio, and Djokovic Rabbit. They lost to the team of King Tonga, Luther Biggs, Glacier, so he's back with Buzz Stern, and Ernest Miller. Good Lord. <laughs> he has... 25 recorded matches on cage match in his entire career so Luther Biggs only has 7 less matches than Adrian Bird who was an actual good wrestler he had this is his 8th match ever televised his 2nd sorry this is his 8th match recorded his 2nd match ever televised do you know when his first match was no you would have assumed, like, at some... We missed it on one of the shows we didn't watch since they started doing this gimmick. No, his only other televised loss was on a WCW Saturday Night taping in 1996. He's been in the power plant for over three no, years. No, he can't have been. That He lost in that match to Ice Train. And then over 97 and 98, he had two more losses on WCW Pro. Uh, one to Ice Train again, and another to Alex Wright. What? He would have one more match on Thunder, which is next month. He would have three more matches in WCW total. And then he has two in TNA. Dave, I genuinely think I could train for... I'll be generous, six months... And be more competent than this guy was after, like, four years in the power plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you know who he was in TNA? Uh, What his gimmick name was, should I know? It's not like he's massively famous. I'm trying to think of the early Well, he is if you're... I know Garrett Kidney is currently screaming it at us. Go on, go, tell us. He was Disgraceland. That ring a bell, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh we should we should probably have called up Garrett for his, his disgrace land takes. Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna text Garrett right now as we're on this show and say, Garrett, we're recording a show and I would like your thoughts on Disgrace Land, please. Uh give me a moment here now. You you can edit all this out yeah. if you want. It's just, I, I know yeah. I know you're not going to though. Uh, no, I will. I, pro- I I mean, maybe I will. You won't. We'll see. Just because you're an awful fucking editor. Uh- <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. No, I only don't edit things out when it's you spilling beer on yourself because that's funny to Never me. Never happened. Um, they even botched the finish in this match, Dave. Yeah. Talk talk about this incredible Matt classic as I text Garrett Kidney. So, Eaton gets a neck breaker and it's not supposed to be the finish because... Glacier is supposed to break up the pin except Glacier is out of position for no apparent reason and misses breaking up the pin and I believe it's Slick Johnson as the ref just counts three which he should and yeah so Bobby wins and then Glacier puts a full Nelson on both Eaton and Biggs with the idea of being it's tough love Dave you shown some tough love to Luther Biggs mm-hmm. Do you think, like, at what point do you think during the, like, the, them doing the backstage stuff, did they get a whiff of how shit this guy was and decide to immediately abandon ship on this? Well, the fact... Because this was communicated straight away that this thing is, this is dead in the water, dead on arrival. The fact that he gets trotted out again next month tells me not very fucking immediately. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but it's only about, I think, two or three weeks from now, so it's probably, like, the next set of tapings, and then he's done. Um... Yeah, it's uh if if Miss Mr. Garrett comes back to you at some point before we finish recording, we can go back to his uh his disgrace land takes. Yes, I'm I'm very excited to get them. So much so that I'm messaging him on multiple platforms about this. 
as he'd be like, Jesus, the people really want to know about this guy. Um, and hey, but make, yeah, uh, if you if you make, do want to know about right. Disgraceland, go check out Garrett's podcasts. Go check out. You got to be kidding yes. me, because they've they've already long since passed when Disgraceland was around, so they've definitely talked about it. Um, I do love, by the way, he sucks so bad that um, when this beatdown happens at the end, when Bull Stern gets and beats down, they cheer. I mean, the set, I did love that. The, the South loves a bit of t- tough love. This is true. This is true. Um, may I interest you in what I'm sure was your match of the night? We're moving on to next. You want to talk about, like, bad to worse. Look, I, I'll always have time for Brad Armstrong. But when yeah, this poor when guy. Horace comes out, I was like, oh, literally my first thought was, oh, God, are we doing another Horace Hogan push? And, I was like, I was way too quick in calling this the best Thunder in ages. And, uh, <laughs> I was delightfully surprised that we are, in fact, not doing a Horace Hogan push, Dave. We no, are, in fact, doing a Brad not. Armstrong push. Yeah, it's the, like the fourth rebrand of BA since I wrote... This is BA reboot number four hundred. Now that the No Limit Soldiers have disbanded, um, well, his two boys got fired, didn't they? Swole and four by four. Yeah, and just Master P has just noped out of the place. So, so uh, BA has crawled back to the family, as we learn. He captained a yeah. an Armstrong team on Saturday night. Containing, are, are you comfortably seated, Lee? Never, but go on. Because this is where I alluded to we would get back to this earlier on. This is where I had the moment. I was like, why is why have these last two matches been on TV? And I was like, wasn't Van Hammer supposed to wrestle Sid <laughs> at some point? Okay. And I looked into it. Um, see, the way he was supposed to do it, uh, was it Nitro this past week? He yeah, was he, was, to wrestle Sid he, for the he US was supposed style. to challenge the winner of the main event from Thunder on Nitro. So he didn't. Huh. Um, he randomly does get the match two weeks from now on Nitro. Okay. And gets killed in three minutes. Oh. <laughs> oh. Poor Van Hammer. I, uh, I, I, yeah. I hope they played the video. I, I hope they I, played the video. I from have an update. From three weeks ago. I was just saying Van Hammer. Sorry, I have an update. Oh, go on. Go on. Gar- Garrett is typing. Oh. <laughs> What were you saying? Um, I was just going to say, I, I hope they played the video from like three weeks previous on Thunder of Van Hammer calling out uh, Sid for the following Nitro and they have no explanation of why it's just taking place three weeks later. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. It's just... I just... Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this Brad Armstrong Horace Hogan match while you were being totally unprofessional looking at your phone. Um, Sorry, I I just got this a simple one liner from Garrett here, and then he logged off. <laughs> he le- leave me to... alone and delete my number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't ever speak to me again. Um, disrespectful to the fly. Oh, he's still typing. Sorry, no, he's coming back. He's coming back. But he started off by saying disrespectful to the flying Elvis legacy. So you talk about this match while I get the rest of his thoughts. Um, I mean, there's not much to talk about. Horace is fucking dog shit as always, and. Like, the crowd aren't into this Brad armstrong Horace Hogan matchup at all. And Larry puts over Brad's finish, which is a side Russian leg sweep. Now, I'm sure you enjoyed the side Russian leg sweep being the finish. Because, you know, you're, yes. you're the side Russian leg sweep guy. I love a side Russian leg sweep, I do. And you can tell, like, this is bad, but it's not because of Brad. And you can also tell that the commentators do like VA. Like, you know, they really are like, God, I fucking wish this guy could stick I together. hope this works for him. Yeah, like, they're, they're trying for one push to kind of stick with him. Um, but go on, what, is Mr. Kidney still typing? He has said that uh, I gave his match against Shark Boy one star. So that's funny that he showed that he showed up in TNA wrestling a man that also debuted on this Thunder. Uh, that's that's very a very very nice little coincidence there. We move on to the next match, and you want to talk about things that signal when a gimmick is complete death. We have the filthy animals, Kidman versus Rey Mysterio. They're on the ascent versus the West Texas Rednecks, Kendall Windham and Curly Bill. So, could Curly Bill and Kendall Windham? 
be the least talented tag team in the history of pro wrestling. Now, people who are younger and didn't watch WCW and aren't watching these shows along don't know who we're talking about. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to gonna explain. You, you need to know who Cordy Bill is. <laughs> no, because no, I can't in good conscience make them go look up this episode and be like, oh, hell yeah, who's this Cordy Bill guy? It's fucking Vincent. It's Virgil, yes. Yes. And as soon as he came out, I wrote all caps. Oh no, Curly Bill, this gimmick is dead. Um, I do love that Larry just goes, hey, that's Vincent. Like, he just yeah, yeah, no just, pretenses that he watched no, Nitro. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, Lee, no one's allowed to have nicknames. So it's consistency on Larry's part. <laughs> yeah, but like, you can just tell um, Larry is just like, why is Vincent with the rednecks? <laughs> Um. Oh God. Yeah, this sucks bad. I don't. I really don't have any notes on it. Uh, Ray and Kidman aren't miracle workers, so what the fuck do you expect? Kidman. Uh, they both get hot tags where people get up out of their chairs for about twenty seconds, and then everyone remembers that the other two guys fucking suck, and then calm back down. Um. The finish is Re- is Kidman slingshotting Ray into a middle rope hurk and ran on Curly Bin- Bill, and I swear to God, Curly Bill na- nearly landed on his forehead. So, taking this two bump. things about this: one, Curly Bill did not set up properly to take the Rough Rider. He actually had his head up okay. at the middle turnbuckle, not the bottom turnbuckle. You see, he is an idiot. Yes, I know. And secondly, so Kidman and Ray had been doing the assisted Rana for months at this point. But normally the way they do it is Kidman will launch Ray with like a, you know, your favorite move, the, the falling power, backward, backwards power bomb, the uh, alley-oop. The alley-oop? Yeah. <laughs> That's a fucking classic, mate. So normally Kidman will, will alley-oop. Alley-oop. <laughs> will alley-oop Ray up into the, the Hurricanrana. But not this time because I have no doubt that both Kidman and Ray were like, fuck that, he will let you fall and you will die. So Kidman very yeah. gently put Ray up onto uh, Vincent's shoulders for the Rana. Match sucked. <laughs> it was bad. Is this is this the worst match involving either Kidman or Ray we've ever seen? Yeah, I, I really this? wish they had to just replay the Kidman versus Psychosis from, from Nitro. Also, yeah. Kidman had a heck of a shiner as well. Uh, Apparently Psycho fucking landed a punch on him. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna. I, I know that this main event is Lee Malone territory, so I am. I'm quite happy to sit back and listen to you gush because this is the fucking mecca of big lads wrestling that you crave in your life, my friend. This is Scott Norton versus Goldberg. The only thing I will say before this match starts. Is Larry alleging Scott Norton is over six foot five inches tall, which is absolute bollocks? <laughs> I, I can I can accept some uh, some exaggeration from Larry for this match. What I will say is that like apparently his shoot height is about six two, so he wasn't even exaggerating by that much. But he was ag- he was exaggerating by enough that I was like, that's nonsense. Well, I mean, look, if Adam Cole is six foot. Yeah, I mean he's eight foot yeah, then. So, um, okay, th- this match, this this match only goes like it's sub four minutes. Yeah, and I don't exaggerate to say this might be my favorite Thunder match we've ever had. I yeah fucking I adored this everything start to finish. We get the full Goldberg entrance with the cops and Dillinger. Mm-hmm. The crowd are going fucking apeshit. And then one thing, mm-hmm. there's one little detail that we have not seen before. And I fucking love it and I want some company to do this. So we get the full Goldberg walk from the locker room. And then he gets yeah. to Gorilla. And then the camera just goes and we get uh, action shots of Goldberg destroying people. It's only like two or three little clips, but it is fucking incredible. While you still have Goldberg's music booming in your ear, and then Goldberg's out on the stage, surrounded by Pyro. It is fucking just incredible uh, 
TV, like um, editing, whatever you want to call it. Production, that's the word I was struggling for. Production. Just great production, and I want more companies. Like, I don't need to see somebody walk down a fucking rampway. Give me five or ten seconds of action shots on an entrance. Like, it's just so simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this match is just these two beating the ever-loving fuck out of each other. Like, Goldberg gives gives Norton a lot in this. Mm-hmm. While also he sells, while also not selling, it it's so fucking it, it's just perfect. Do you know what it's reminiscent of to me? A match we gushed about at the time during Goldberg's ascent. Do you remember he had that one Thunder match with Glacier where they just fucking went yes. for it, and they were just laying mm-hmm. into each other. That's that's what this reminded me of. But obviously now Goldberg is in the position of like established star. Yeah, and I mean you you said it in the DMs, and I'll give you credit for this. This is the most 1998 Goldberg has felt since he won the belt. Like, this yeah. just had such Goldberg on the Ascension vibes. and They went back to the formula, but in a way that didn't feel cheap. It felt like, because you'd also done... The, if, if Scott Norton just randomly returned, you'd be like, okay, right, well, this is just they're trying to juice up Goldberg. But they did the thing where they had him come back, beat people down in an angle. In an angle and call, do a promo, and call, a class and promo. Call out Goldberg. He's going to kick the shit out of yeah. Goldberg. Um, like even simple things, like they're on the outside and they're fucking laying into each other. And Norton rams Goldberg's head twice into the ring post, and Goldberg sells it. But then Goldberg gets a hold of Norton and just fucking rams his head into it once, and Norton's out on the ground. Like just simple little things like that, where you're going, yeah, Goldberg's putting over Norton here, but he's also shown that he's tough as fuck. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I love the spot where they both go for the flying tackle in the ring. So, and they just like, oh. yeah, it, it's the the best way I can describe it is you know the end of Rocky where they're doing the, this the sparring mm-hmm. match, and yeah. it's just the, the two gloves crossing. This is just two guys going fucking full pelt and flying at each other. It's fucking great. And the fact that it then plays in the very next spot, they both get to their feet. Somebody mm-hmm. whips one, one of them whips the other into the ropes. We get the duck down. They hit the, the opposite ropes, and as, as I can only assume, Norton is going to go for the flying tackle again. Goldberg hits the spear. It's fucking incredible. That's storytelling in a match, Dave. That is how you tell a fucking yeah. story in a match. And then Goldberg, while well, Tanae is screaming, hits the jackhammer. It's like, even the announcers in this match, Tanae and Larry are fucking great. They were, but there was also a scent, like a little part of my brain that was like, all this is missing is Heenan. I, I, we did not talk about this. I had the exact same fucking thought. This is the first, <laughs> I, I'm not even joking, this is the first time in Larry's run where I was like, God, if, if Hina were here. Yeah. Yeah. There is a great closing line as the air, as the show goes off the air from Tanae, though. Like, he does a perfect rap on this perfect segment where he said, there's no one like Goldberg. There has never been anyone like Goldberg. It's so fucking great. That is how you fucking say this is the guy. Uh, yeah, that's your guy. And that's why everything should be fucking built around him. And I will say it yeah. till the fucking blue in the face. They could have torn this company around if they just fucking got out of their own way and put this man back got, on top. Got out of fucking Terry's way. Like the fact that, you know, we read it at the start of the show, the fact that they had to have a meeting and sit him down and go, hey, you know, this guy that's a, like that's absolutely nuclear hot in spite of how much we fucking hobbled him in the last year. We're going to have to go with him, Terry. Is that OK? You know, like fucking nonsense. Fucking nonsense. Um, this is great. Uh, uh, it's just yeah. fucking one of the best sub five minute matches I've ever seen. I genuinely yeah. think it's fucking incredible. This was without that kind of like two and a half match lull in the middle. Like this is a nine match show, so to, to be able to say that like 
six matches are well worth your time. Mm-hmm. Like not in terms of maybe star ratings, but in terms of like they're either a hoot or a very well executed TV match. Um is remarkable for Thunder. Like I thought these days were long gone and the most effusive we'd get in our praise of a Thunder was when stuff was so bad that we spent two two hours just laughing our heads off at how bad yeah, it was. Like we we thought competence was like the ceiling for this. But um like I, I was genuine like I was high on wrestling last night after watching this. I was just yeah. so fucking jazzed up after this. And I like I was thinking, I was like, is it just a case of of the fact that we do watch so much bad that when we do get something like this that feels so much more and if somebody were to just drop in and watch this one match would it hit the way it hits for us and I don't know yeah and I I, I will like when this episode drops I will link I will try and find a link for this match and link it in the discord and like try and get people's reactions because I genuinely think it's fucking great like I do Yeah, it's ah look, it's it's great, it's great. Anyway, um, overall thoughts uh, to to wrap up uh, in terms of winners and losers. You've kind of, I think we've we've tipped the hand of what we thought of the show. Yeah, the show was really good. Um, winners and losers, like Goldberg, obviously big fucking winner. Like great promo, fucking awesome match. Um. I'm, top man I'm really into this like I don't know how much of it we're going to see but I'm into this Hoovy Psychosis La Parca trio like I know Chavo's mm-hmm. unfortunately linked with them but yeah. if it's more of those three just wrestling together I'm fine with that mm-hmm. and yeah. hopefully Norman doesn't disappear again but there's no guarantee of that and look again I don't know how much more of it we're going to see but I really hope we get to see more of Brandy and Mona. Yeah, for sure. You want to know what a great barometer of how good this show was, Lee? Go for it. The finish counter brought to you by Ludwig Borga. Nine matches with eight clean finishes and one non-finish, which was an awesome Scott Norton, Scott Norton yeah, run Scott in. Norton beat down, <laughs> which contributed to the whole show overall. Yeah. That's how you do a thunder, folks. That even the stuff that sucked, or the stuff that had, the stuff that had green or terrible wrestlers in it, you've still booked your episode of TV well enough that that's not what we're thinking. You opened with a great forty-five minutes of TV, you closed with a fucking kick-ass angle, and you've made it apparent what the pay-per-view is, the, what the big matches of the pay-per-view is. You've added a couple of matches to the pay-per-view, and you've pushed a few pieces around the board to book further matches for the paper. And do, do you well. know what's funny? You talked about like that open in 45 minutes. There's nobody above like lower mid card in those opening segments. No. Like it's six cruiserweights, mm-hmm. Norman, and the, the two women who obviously have a yeah. ceiling on them in this company. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's not stars there, but the show was fucking like it was really damn good, and yeah. that just shows. And like we we see it now with like AEW, particularly like Collision, where you can just put out people on a wrestling show because wrestling fans like wrestling. Yeah, simple as, simple as, and lessons that I think, unfortunately, we know WCW don't take, um, but lessons I hope modern wrestling companies take that like you don't have to be afraid of wrestling um just book wrestling on your wrestling show it's ultimately what people want anyway. you know um yeah anyway right that's going to do it for this episode of days of thunder thank you all so much for listening we'll be back on the free feeds in two weeks we will be back uh, behind the paywall on patreon next week um in the meantime check us out uh everywhere um, we have had uh, a couple of clips of old episodes of the show go up on YouTube. So uh, if you're a long term, long time fan uh, and listener of the show, please go to the Voices of Wrestling YouTube channel, grab those, share them around. Uh, maybe your mates or other people on the social media uh, haven't uh, tried the show before and they want a nice snapshot. 
Uh, I know the total package is the to- no the total package story isn't up yet. The total package story is going mm-hmm. up. Uh, we have as of time of recording, uh, us discovering that the Jesse Ventura movie exists, and God, what was the other one that went up? Oh, the for the Enos Alert. Oh yes, the the original uh, time I surprised us with the Enos Alert theme song. Uh, is up and yes two of our favorites the total package story and of course the story of my granddad versus the magpies are coming at some stage soon to the youtube um and we will be sharing those on twitter but uh thanks very much for for checking out days of thunder again uh we shall see you all very very soon uh goodbye thanks everyone for listening to another episode of days of thunder days of thunder was produced by lee malone and edited by me dave ryan Keep up to date with the show and find all the ways to listen to us. You can follow us on Twitter at WCW Thunderpod or click the Linktree link in our Twitter bio or in the show notes. I am at the Day to Dave on Twitter and Lee is at Malone underscore 713. Days of Thunder is a part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Follow the VOW network anywhere. Good podcasts are sold for more fine podcasts than you can shake a stick at. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tyler Fornis, and I am the co-host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hunky here on the Voice Wrestling Podcasting Network. Every week, my co-host Fred Moreland and I discuss all the happenings of All Elite Wrestling and everything going on in the universe of Tony Khan. We talk about Dynamite, we talk about Rampage, and we will talk about Collision when the time comes as well, along with all the appearances outside of AEW from all the best talents in all elite wrestling. This is one of the more cohesive wrestling companies in the entire world, and we discuss every intricacy about it, including the unique booking of Tony Khan that is both a huge positive and a major detriment. Check us out every single Thursday here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network.